right, now I'll move. I'm saying I'm great. How are you doing? All right, there you go. All right. So let's jump in. Uh, I want the theme of our uh, update today to be, uh, what are we predicting around prices? So we go over numbers, uh, but I think prices is is a little uh, subjective, meaning uh, what what are we telling people is going to happen to prices? So let's use that as we go through today's conversation. How's that? Perfect. All right. So let's jump through these numbers. We got uh, in Fulton County, as predicted, last week, Thanksgiving holiday disrupted uh, active inventory, but we are back up 716 active listings this morning. Actually, quite a bit of jump from two weeks ago, actually. So uh, kind of nice to see that. Um, 92 active under contract, 182 pending, uh, 134 expired. Uh, last 30 days ago, it was 139. So the the flow of expireds is kind of consistent, I think, right now. But 231 closings, I think that picked up some from the week before. What do you make of Fulton County, Kelly Chancy? Uh, I definitely feel the holidays is always a factor. I am happy to see that the active under contract, I mean, we just put stuff under the, under contract. I like that that is staying relatively in line. You see kind of that slow drip from September through December, which is um, of the active, just, you know, just as a gradual, so you feel it. it, it this is where you do have to watch stats because yeah. it's not, not necessarily these stats. When people quote percentages, um, I mean, okay, that's right there. We're looking at about like 37 different, uh, 37 different pending homes. Well, that could seem sound like a high percentage, but you know, but it's not. It's just a slow. We're seeing a slow drip. Of, yeah, and if if you've sold real estate for any number of years, that I could almost call that seasonality. That's kind of what correct. it normally looked like, right? Like uh, end of the summer, 129 under contract, slowing down to 92 by first of December. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know it's, too, the, it's too much to tell. It's seasonality, and you know this. December 5th, you could possibly still close by December 31, but, you know, we're starting to, to put stuff under contract for January, February, which is traditionally our slowest closing month in Metro 100%. Atlanta. But you see the same kind of thing in pendings, 238 went up to 290, uh, down to about 182. I mean, it's a normal third and fourth quarter slowdown. So I don't really feel like there's any panic button economic concern here. Um, I'm telling you, we, we're seeing it in the closings, though, uh, meaning uh, we're not necessarily closing as many as we have. October was brutal. November was uh, mm -hmm. OK, but October, it just came to a screeching halt for a minute. Um, and then we uh, looking at December right now. December looks pretty okay. I wouldn't say great, but it, it looks pretty yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, October is when interest rates were holding steady above 7%. And we've been fortunate in seeing them starting to come down little by little, um, November now going into December. So uh, those, it just makes it more affordable. Um, and quite honestly, which I know we're going to get to, um, jumbo rates. They're yeah. amazing right now compared to what they were 5.5% yep. on some, you know, so. So um, one of my questions, yeah, one, I mean, rates are drive a half this conversation, right? One of my Correct. questions I'm asking myself, and I don't have the answer, it's an out loud question, is I'm constantly looking at the relationship between the blue and the red line. And are they getting tighter or wider you know, I don't even know that we still have it on here, but at one point in time, we were like begging some gap between the two. Um, but obviously, if you take last week out of the equation, um, I, it kind of looks like the blue line's trending down a little bit, which speaks to our uh, our seasonality conversation a little bit. 
Um, but that mm -hmm. tells me it's getting a little bit tighter between closings and active inventory, which what's not inside of this is uh, all the data you need to be able to have a smart, intelligent conversation around supply and demand, which drives our prices. Correct. Right? Um, Correct. So unfortunately, we don't have all the data, but uh, I think prices are starting to hold. I was a little concerned they were going to slide. Um, I may, I'm being very general in my statements right now because we're going to talk about luxury versus uh, uh, other markets versus different pockets of Atlanta. But in a general statement, prices are holding the line at the moment. Uh, and I think it has right. a lot to do with this relationship between inventory. Um, let's just run through the counties real quick. Uh, 392 in DeKalb County, active inventory. Uh, 54 at under contract. It doesn't look like it's much of a decline there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit. Um, pending, 161 over here, down to 128 over here. A little bit of a down downward trend here. Closings at 139. I mean, they're kind of holding, well, right? Well, look at how much inventory was there in September yeah. compared to now. So, but we're still similar actives and similar pending. You're close enough pendings. So, uh, ratio wise, we're much closer for sure. Um, and I think that has, to, you know, your September active. It's like you know they just get back into the school year. So that's you know everyone puts it back on at the moment. And so either they sold over time or they decided. To either, uh, well, we don't have a ton that expired, but yeah. so it's Cobb, steady. Cobb County, 402 active, which is still decent, 71 under mm -hmm. contract, uh, 154 pending, and 164 closing. Same story. So all three counties right now are telling me the same story. But I want to talk about something that's a little bit different. So on Inman, this article is talking about home builders avoid mass layoffs as brokerages post big hiring month. So here's the what I'll, I'm almost making an inference around this article. But remember, Atlanta is a top four new home market in the country, meaning we, a big part of our market is driven by home builders and new construction. And home builders are very fickle. They don't like to get caught uh, in an economic transition. But all of a sudden, they're not laying their people off, which tells me that they think this is going to be a little bit short-lived, meaning mm -hmm. okay, uh, it may look a little weird for six months, but people are going to start popping these houses under contract by March next year. And... Uh, they've got enough backlog of uh, inventory of people waiting two years to build houses or a year to build houses. The home builders are betting on the future. And I think we should take notice of that. What do you make of it? I'm making an inference here, but what do you make of that? Well, and I'm, I'm sure a lot has to do with there was such a lack of labor um, during the pandemic that if you have someone quality, you do whatever you can to keep them um, with you. And I do feel that they watch, like the Builder Association watches these stats at a very high level. Your big builders are trying to unload inventory, um, but your smaller custom building, they didn't, I, I found a lot of them didn't overbuy. Like they, um, like perhaps they did in the uh, 2008 recession. So there is still, um, you know, I, I found that the custom builders that we find a lot in, in, in town Atlanta and even outside in the suburbs, they, they've been much more, um, how can I put moderate in their approach to um, building? So they're not over building. As a matter of fact, they, I know many have stayed extremely conservative, being concerned since the pandemic naturally change the way they did things anyway sure. so I, I would probably agree with what you're trying to infer they they, uh, they they they're prepared for the long game i also think um th th there's a lot of margin in a new home and mm. i think they increased that margin pretty heavily over the last couple of years call it supply chain call it whatever um they 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 got 
pretty fat in 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 the margin of their their construction. So they probably have a little room to play with here, uh, where mm -hmm. your typical resale doesn't. But uh, anyway, we'll leave it there. I just think it's important because uh, sometimes builders love us and sometimes they don't. And we've got a love-hate relationship with them, obviously. But they are smart people and they understand the economy just like we try to study and learn the economy as well. So I pay attention to what they do. When they're making moves, we're making moves, right? So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just thought this was a uh, behind the read between the lines that uh, they're betting on the future as well. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. This one uh, I, I, it was awesome to me. Um, <clears throat> they fired the CEO of Open Door. By the way, he started the company, which is even. Mm -hmm. great. Um, but remember, when you're a publicly traded company on Wall Street and you lose a billion dollars, somebody's going to have somebody to hold accountable. And they shook things up. The founder, Eric Wu, was replaced by the CFO, which I'm going to come back to that in a minute, and the president's resigned. So do I think open doors going away? Not at all. Do I still think they're the, the giant eye buying company <clears throat> that will be in the marketplace in the future? I do. Um, but mm -hmm. I will tell you, uh, it is tough going, making big money in the eye buying business. And, uh, you, the remember the graph, we've talked about it on here before, around the pendulum swinging when the market shifts and how fast it shifted. Well, mm -hmm. this is a product of how fast the economy shifted. Uh, they, Correct. they weren't able to that. shift fast enough, right? So the question is, is the CFO or call it the MCA of, of Open Door or the, the CPA of Open Door going to be able to run the company based on profit margins in the future, which is to me what, once again, I'm reading between the lines, but that's their bet, right? Like the, the visionaries out, let's see if we can take the uh, person that runs the numbers that can run us back to profitability. Uh, I, I find it interesting. Anything you read in this that you thought was worthy? No, but I did not necessarily just there, but I do know that they've recently partnered um, like Zill, you know, Zill got out of the iBuying business. And then they now have partnered with Open Door, and they're trying to go. Well, what what's their lane? And I agree with you that Open Door is going to be the probably the top popular eyebar, kind of like you know Zill is the top online search and you know home search engine. It's just how it kind of happened over time. It's just interesting that they're how they're um, you know that partnership of understanding are they just the numbers trying to buy Zillow's actually. They're getting out of the sales team, but they just want to be the sell, sell the leads kind of a company. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I think the open door, the concept of open door works if you can predict pricing in a very short amount of time. Um, and when things change so rapidly, you cannot predict what pricing will be in 90 days like it was this year. So 100%. it's a flipping business. So here's another thing. If you're reading into this, the company's moving pro, uh, moving forward with a product called exclusives. So what Open Door is trying to do is create a off market marketplace for people to buy and sell real estate that's exclusive of the MLS and exclusive of real estate agents. So Open Door say, telling sellers, "Sell with us, we'll save you money." Is going to charge them a five percent fee. And they're going to have this product called exclusives. Here's the challenge. <clears throat> you got to have massive market share to be able to create some kind of portal that has the consumer's uh, eyeballs. The reason Zillow got so big so fast is they had all the real estate. So they had all mm -hmm. the eyeballs. You, Open Door at one point in time might have had 10% market share which was a considerable amount to be able to go create a little uh, marketplace outside of the MLS. But if they've stopped buying houses, uh, that inventory is going slower and lower and lower and lower. 
but it's it'll be interesting to watch because this is what they're betting on on the future is this product called exclusives which is really an off-market uh marketplace um so heads up just pay attention all mm -hmm. right so this article kelly is on the atlanta business chronicles talking about yep. decap county suburbs lead the metro area and home price appreciation and here's why yeah i think you our know, very own sean is is in there uh, oh i know well it has everything to do with the uh proximity yep sean managing it uh, yeah. metro atlanta uh it That's has everything cool. to do with proximity to downtown right um mm -hmm. but it reminded me of an article we had on here uh about a month ago i think this article came out on october 28th um so it's maybe 30 days old but if you get down here to this graph and my pointer is downtown so it shows you where the fiery hot pricing is going on so you got mm -hmm. the east side of downtown atlanta east you got southwest atlanta so the, uh, there's there's a lot of uh, argument that um, the south side of Atlanta is going to be a big development area in the near future. Um, but mm -hmm. we saw it happening on the east side as well. Um, that's mm -hmm. not to say we're not price appreciating in the north. I just think the demand for real estate is going faster down here because of the price point. It's, it's affordability. Yeah. I, I will say the best thing about selling real estate in Metro Atlanta is that our suburbs and our all these in town neighborhoods are actually cool. And so it's kind of follow along that I 20 and then going into that Tucker, even Stone Mountain's going through their downtown's going through revitalization. Tucker's downtown is revitalization. Uh, Scott, uh, Scottsdale, and um, you can find some at Clarkston is going through so many things. I feel that um, it kind of, it's just the affordability of those areas because it's now they, you have to watch like the, it kind of spreads. How do you revitalize starting in town and then it keeps going this way or going south. So I think it is prime. Um, I, and yeah, you got proximity, but it's also cool that you get to live in an area that you still have things in your own community, like Avondale Estates has cool stuff. I mean, things all in this area has cool things that you can live, work, play in one spot. And and I'd like to remind people, like, this is being, we're being general in our commentary. Uh, real estate's hyper-local. Certain neighborhoods go faster than others, and certain Correct. neighborhoods go slower yeah. than others. Um, the neighborhood Kelly and I, or Kelly's building in and I live in, uh it has gone really really fast right but it's up here in the parts mm -hmm. that's not even uh under mention so it, it just depends on where you live and, and that kind of thing all right let's talk luxury mm -hmm. so i i found this very uh i don't want to call it elementary but i think i already knew all this but it's worthy of a conversation so it said here mm -hmm. are the features Atlanta buyers want in luxury homes. They want a flat walkout backyard. They want swimming pools, new construction or a recent renovation, rooms. I mean, we're getting high tech here. Dedicated study rooms for children and location, location, location. Am I crazy or is that a little elementary? <laughs> You know, honestly, it's, uh, yeah, it's elementary. Um, okay. I, it's elementary. But I would say if I were to go to what's different than how it's been before is most homes would have had maybe one space for a home office, maybe one space for maybe the kids to go play in. Okay, you need three, maybe you need four. You need play space, kids workspace, and then the you know the two works you know, work from home spaces yep. but that's easily accommodated because a lot of these luxury homes and then when we say luxury we're there they're obviously there's luxury in terms of a high scale and then luxury because of a certain price point um they all have like a basement that's finished or they have some other space that you can you know um make these um you know meet the needs of the family i'd be really interested to see you know um I'm, I grew up in Florida and everybody in Florida has a pool because you can actually swim in the pool 12 months out of the year. 
Um, but I'd be really interested in seeing three to five years from now um, if our lifestyles change, if pool is now seen as a luxury. It certainly is a luxury because the maintenance of it is. Or is it seen now as a burden because of maintaining a pool is different, um, you know, when you don't get to use it as often? Yeah, I mean, I remember when I first got into real estate, like all the new construction homes had uh, study options. And then mm -hmm. uh, then for probably 10 years, very few houses had studies in them anymore. And then all of a sudden now every house has a study in it. Uh, and that's just a function of the pandemic. So the trends change over time, right? Like people go to office environment, work from home, go back to office environment. Uh, they want their kids indoors. They want their kids outdoors. Um, I think uh, understanding the luxury trends uh, is important if you sell in the luxury market. You know, they had a... Uh, a big architect come to the luxury um, uh, symposium. Yeah, the the symposium we had it's, in Boston, and it was pretty interesting what they were putting into these houses. People well, wanted like spa like bathrooms and stuff like that. Well, and that's like and that's like real luxury. That's like five million plus luxury. If we talk in a Metro Atlanta, you know, if they will call luxury eight fifty or above depends upon maybe 750 in the suburbs maybe you know buckhead's um average price point and this is buckhead 1.2 um so when you call so 1.2 is considered i'm just gonna say because average price point average home it uh so it's the uber luxury wants the uber spas and that's five million three point something six point something twenty million that's different kind of luxury but atlanta luxury I think it varies where you are based on your price point. And I'm, I'm with you. Like there is a segment of the market that lives in ultra luxury and yeah. they do want the spa bath, but your everyday person that because of prices increasing, maybe there's obviously their sellers would have had to increase. They can now go into a 1.2, 1.5, 1.8. And um, five years ago, that 1.2 house would have been an 850 house. Yeah. So it's, it doesn't have the awesomeness of like these ultra luxury. What oh. it, they are wanting is, you know, some place to enjoy their home, um, whether they work from home or not. I would um, say because of that, um, you know, and even reading the, like the Institute of Luxury Marketing articles, um, Metro Atlanta, they, they break up luxury to two areas. They do Atlanta. And then they Duluth, which is Sugarloaf, um, you know, country club area. And if you're in Atlanta at the luxury price point, it's still a seller's market because the inventory is low. If you do go outside a little bit further, like Duluth, as they, they mentioned, it does um, favor buyers a little more. There's just more inventory. And that's just kind of makes sense. Yeah. But so let's, I, let's take I, this back to our theme ahead. for a minute. Uh, we've got five minutes left. Um, yeah. Pricing. So let, I'll, I'll, I want to end on luxury, but let's start on regular for a minute or non-luxury. Do we actually believe prices are going to go backwards? What do you think? Um, if, if they've already started to fall, but like this. And I think it's going to be, again, area by area, neighborhood by neighborhood, but you're not seeing big shifts. Uh, big drops. I think you're going to, and you may see like, okay, Thanksgiving weekend. Okay. Someone took a little lower price on a Thanksgiving weekend, but I honestly think we're going to know at the fed meeting in December, if that reaction to it means interest rates continue to drop or their reaction to that means interest rates go up. If they continue to drop, we're not seeing anything drop anymore. We're going to flat line and then start to go back up in spring. If we see interest rates go up, I think, okay, we'll, we'll have, but it's like this, it's a nuance. It's like you wiggle back and forth, like a rocking chair, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit, but nothing dramatic. Um, and those who are hoping for the market to see prices go down further before jumping in, I think they're only waiting to meet more competition at the same time they want to jump in. Yeah. You know, Kelly, I'll, I, I literally just bought a car today and I paid probably more than I wanted to. And I paid an interest rate higher than I was comfortable paying. 
And the whole time I'm going, I'm totally a buyer, in, just like people buying houses right now. And I thought about mm -hmm. it. I went, okay, I could wait a year and probably pay less for the same car or wait six months and get a different interest rate. But here's what I reminded myself. I wanted the stinking car. My mm -hmm. motivation said I wanted to buy the car. So guess what? I bought the car and I paid more than I probably would a year from now. And I probably have a higher interest rate that I'll refinance in six months. But my motivation drove the sale. And I think real estate's no different. Um, mm -hmm. maybe the price will go down, maybe the interest rate will go down, but don't count out people's motivations. That's what's causing the sale to happen in the first place, right? Now, do I think there'll be houses that have multiple offers come March? I do. Mm -hmm. Do I think mm -hmm. there'll be houses that have to sell at a discounted price come March? I do. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see a, a gap, a separation between the beauty contest and everybody else, where in the past, all the houses sold. And I think the good ones are going to prevail Correct. and the bad ones are not. I'm 100% in agreement with you. Your pretty homes, you're not going to get discounted. Your fixer-uppers, the ones that need work, yeah, those. that's where you're going to see price. So you do have to watch the stats because they're going to average all that together. But pretty will sell with minor price negotiations. Again, once priced correctly, if they start way too high, that's another story, but, but in line with the comps. Yeah. And I, luxury, I, I actually, think luxury is going to be very dependent on some factors, meaning how old the house is, uh, where it's located, amenities. Once again, it's going to be a beauty contest. Um, and, and, and I think that's really what's going to drive the next six months. Uh, and, you know, and I just think people's lives are so busy that to that luxury article, they want move in ready. And I really, really, really think that and honestly, that's with all price points. Um, I think that getting it move in ready, getting it updated to look, you know, equivalent to a 2023, in this case, look of a house. Use that Keller concierge to get your house updated. You probably have the equity to do it. I think that's what buyers are looking for. Those will demand the prices. Um, those who enjoy fixer uppers, that's your opportunity right now. There you go. There's your industry update. Monday, we start and end on time. Have a good one. Yes. All right. Bye.